So it, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Emily Knox. Uh, Dr. Knox is the Interim Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and an Associate Professor in the School of Information Sciences at the University of Illinois at Ur Urbana-Champaign. Her book, Book Banning in the 21st Century America, is the first monograph in the Beta Phi Mu Scholar Series. She also recently edited Trigger Warnings, History, Theory, Context. Um, and she co-edited Foundations of Information Ethics. Her articles have been published in the library, in library Quarterly, Library and Information Science Research, and the Journal of Intellectual Freedom and Privacy. Emily serves on the boards of the Beta Phi Mu and the, the National Coalition Against Censorship. Her research interests include information access, intellectual freedom and censorship, information ethics, information policy, and the intersection of print culture and reading practices. She's also a member of the Mapping Information Access Research Team. Um, Emily received her PhD from the doctoral program at the Rutgers University School of Communication and Information. Her master's in library and information sciences from the I School at Illinois. She also holds a BA in religious studies from Smith College and an AM in the same field from the University of Chicago Divinity School. So I will turn it over to Dr. Knox. Hi, I'm here. Let me just get okay. my slides ready to go. And um, just like in the last session, section, um, we are capturing the questions. So if you all don't mind, please put your questions on the uh, Google link because that will make it easier for us to keep track of your question and to make sure that we don't miss your question. And so we'll post the link to the question in, um, in the chat box again. So I'll be quiet now and it's, um, it's all you Dr. Knox. Do I need to get the um, closed captioning going? Or is it okay? Um, I, I think it's okay. Um, Dr. Cook, do you have the link? It, I don't, yeah, I think whoever the host is has the. Um, okay. Yeah. I'll get to Nico. I'm glad it's working. So I just want to thank Dr. Cook for inviting me to speak today um, at this very important conference. So what I'll be talking about is basically where my research is now, which is thinking about intellectual freedom and social justice in libraries. Um, this has long been an interest of mine. Um, and I recently wrote an article looking at this intersection and how there are tensions between the two of these topics. And I'm going to talk a little bit about where I think they should go and some policy um, recommendation that I have for thinking about, especially social media, um, especially when it comes to things like hate speech online and those kinds of topics. So if you have questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand and ask me. I'm happy to do that to answer any questions you might have. And there's also time for questions at the end. So I generally start by thinking about definitions. I've had a lot of different conversations with people and I try to think through like, what do we mean by this? One thing that might be of interest to you is to realize that in fact, um, librarianship as a whole has never defined intellectual freedom. Um, this is the definition from the Intellectual Freedom Manual. There's a brand new edition out, and that's what you see on the right here. So I tend to use the terms freedom of expression, intellectual freedom, and censorship. So I prefer freedom of expression over free speech, mostly because free speech is highly contested right now. And expression to me is a broader term, right? It encompasses more things than just necessarily what people say, which is what people tend to focus on or what people write when they think about the term like free speech. I often include expression art um, in 
the definition when I think about something like freedom of expression. Intellectual freedom I see as a right of every individual, as you can see this quote here, to seek and receive information from all points of view without restriction. Now, where this becomes contested is what do we mean by restriction? How do we understand what restriction is? Um, then censorship is the suppression of ideas. And what I talk about a lot are censorship practices. That is that they are different actions that an entity, various entities engage in um, that suppress information and ideas. So these, I use the four R's for this. So this is restriction, redaction, relocation, and removal. So those are the easy ways to remember what censorship is. But for us, it's easiest to think about intellectual freedom as a positive right and censorship as a negative action. So I also really think about social justice a lot. One of my issues overall is that there are not a lot of definitions for social justice. A lot of people talk about social justice, but they don't necessarily say, and this is what I mean by social justice. Um, I think it's important to have good uh, foundations and definitions so we know how to communicate what we are trying to say in a particular instance. So I encourage people to take a look at Rawls. Um, uh, this is justice is fairness, right? The idea that there are two principles on social, for justice, social justice, equality of assignment of rights and duties, and that inequalities must be compensated for. Um, I also have from here, this is the uh, Clayton and Williams. This is from their handbook on intellectual justice, on social justice, sorry. Um, and this is about its consent with, with the distribution between the benefits and burdens between different individuals. Finally, I really think that the acknowledgement is really important. So you must acknowledge that there is an injustice before you can look for solutions. So <clears throat> When I do my work, I really try to think about, rather than just use the term social justice, what do I mean as I'm thinking through? At some point I said, this was actually here at the University of Illinois um, when there was a big controversy about uh, Steven Salida and some of his posts on Twitter. I gave this quick gloss where I said, Intellectual freedom is a liberal value while social justice is a progressive value. So what did I mean by that? This was actually in the midst of the 2016 election. And I was sort of using these terms, okay, liberal value, I sort of mean what people mean by Hillary Clinton and progressive, I mean what they mean by Bernie Sanders. But the more I thought about it, I was like, yeah, I'm getting to something here. Um, but what do I mean by liberal and progressive? So what I decided to do was do more research on this and find out what do we mean by liberalism? So in fact, if any of you are political theorists, you actually know that liberalism and progressivism are both actually a type of liberal theory. And so I know I'm using a word to describe a word, but liberalism, as opposed to say, conservatism or anarchy. <laughs> These are other ideas, political ideas that are out there. Liberalism is a set of ideas that are really based in a concern for human rights. So I highly recommend to all, everybody I know, the very short Oxford series. So if you aren't familiar with those, those are always a great place to start on pretty much any topic that might interest you. So this is from the very short Oxford series on liberalism. Um, and what Freedom talks about is how liberalism is a stack of papers. And what the papers do is that there's always at the bottom human rights, but then you might have holes that stick through the piece of paper so that other ideas shine through. So what we might call classical liberalism, which is what I'm seeing is right here, you have human rights on the bottom, that's the purple sheet. Then you have economic freedom as the green sheet, individual progress as the pink sheet, social space as the yellow sheet, and group identity as the blue sheet. 
So if we look at someone who is, for example, classically liberal, who thinks a lot about what do we mean by intellectual freedom, um, for example, <clears throat> That person would have the pink sheet, so that's why I have the pink sheet here behind me, that shines through quite a bit. So you still have the purple sheet on the bottom, but you have more of a shine through of the purple sheet. And this is really the classic value in librarianship of intellectual freedom, based in the works of John Stuart Mill. So I'm sure that many of you are familiar with Mill's On Liberty, it's also the basis for our own political system, thinking about how First Amendment rights work. So <clears throat> the liberal value of individual progress and development is most clearly exemplified in the writings of John Stuart Mill. It's a maximalist approach to regarding the freedom of expression and intellectual freedom, in which censorship is eschewed at all costs. And he posits four grounds for freedom of expression. Those four grounds are that silenced opinions may be true, that science opinion may contain some grain of truth, even if it is held in error, that truth um, must be contested or it is simply prejudiced opinion, and that a belief must be held from conviction, um, from reason and personal experience. So this is from the mid 19th century and it has really guided a lot of ideas. So I am currently working on a, um, a text on intellectual freedom and I'm going through the slow history of looking at how utilitarianism eventually supported intellectual freedom, how that became a major value within um, librarianship and then how it is actually contested through time. So originally it was contested through what we call the fiction question, which is whether or not fiction contains truth. So remember that Mill is talking about silence opinions may be true. So what does it mean if people are in fiction? They are telling stories, are they telling lies? Um, can something that is not nonfiction be true? And if so, what does it mean? Um, or if you don't feel like conviction can be true, what does it mean if you have that in your library and you're trying to have people read the best, but they insist on reading dime store novels, right? This is a continuing question about what do we mean by the best literature um, for people? So this is the classic liberal standpoint. So when I said that intellectual freedom is a liberal value and not a progressive value, this is what I was thinking about. <clears throat> then the progressive is a little bit for me, I realized, um, well, let me start from the beginning. So the progressive standpoint is really this idea, once again, if we look at Rawls, equal assignment of rights and liberties, and that inequalities must be compensated. So if we look at the paper, sheets of paper again, you can see that human rights is still at the bottom, it's always on the bottom. Economic freedom, individual progress does not, is not as uh, much of an emphasis within the progressive standpoint. Instead, there is much more of an emphasis on social space and group identity. I think you can see here how we're getting closer and closer to think about things like social media, and things like bullying and hate speech, right? We're thinking about how people are in the public sphere and their identities in those public spheres. You can see how this comes through. So that's why I have both the yellow and blue um, sheets of paper behind me, um, because those are what really comes through um, as we think through this liberal standpoint. <clears throat> So one person I look at with this is Elizabeth Anderson. She's uh, an ethicist and she talks about in order to have a functioning civil society, you need to have all participate. And she actually mentions that um, if a group is excluded from or segregated within institutions in civil society or subject to discrimination on the basis of ascribed social identities by institutions in the civil society, they have been regulated to sec second class citizenship, even if its members enjoy all of their political rights. So this is really where issues of social space and group identities come 
<clears throat> so these are the different folk foci I have here. So this is John Stuart Mill. He is an, in, an intellectual freedom. Remember, this is just a gloss, a focus on individual progress and development. So if someone as an individual, while social justice has a different gloss, this is John, John Rawls, a focus on social space and now on also group identities. So I, what I'm saying here is that Rawls was much more focused on social space, so how people were in the public sphere, but the way progressive thought has moved recently, there's much more focus also on group identity. But I think it's important to realize like this is all actually liberal ideas. I'll get back to that in a second. This is how this shows up in intellectual free in librarianship. So there's the intellectual freedom roundtable and there's the social responsibilities roundtable. Actually, I've just gotten to this part with my uh, work in, on the manuscript I'm working on now. Tony Samak has an excellent book that talks about the development of these two round tables and why they're often seen at odds to each other, with each other um, even though there are people who are members of both. In fact, it's that the foundations for them are different. Um, if I just go back. So the foundation for the intellectual pro uh, round table is this individual progress. The foundation for the social responsibilities round table are these two, the social space and group identity. But remember they are both related because they are still this liberal standpoint. Um, so next we have, what I'm really thinking about now. So I'm trying to think more about the full spectrum of liberal value. So I now have all of the papers, papers together. So that's what you see right above me here. Thinking about how do we incorporate all of these ideas into one? Because I think that's actually the way forward to think about how do we think through when we encounter information that's bad? How do we create policy that works for um, all of our different communities? So we need this whole spectrum. Human rights, economic freedom, individual progress, social space, and group identity. And this, of course, leads me to intersectionality. So Kimberly Crenshaw, her idea of thinking through I am all of these things, right? I am not just one identity. In fact, I live in, I have my own human rights. I also want to work for people to have economic freedom. In fact, individual progress for myself is very important. Um, I live within a social space and I also have group identities. So I'm, thinking about this a lot, like how do we show this in the world? So I actually was like, well, what does this look like on, on social media? So these are the questions that Twitter and Facebook ask us, right? Um, it asks us these things in this social space and as our own identities. So Twitter says, what's happening, Emily? Emily, black woman, academic, lives in the cornfields, right? Uh, what's on your mind, Emily? Uh, aunt, uh, person who likes to ride bikes. <clears throat> Thinking about those things and how it both pulls in me as an individual and also me within this social space and also my own identities all at once, right? they're all jumbled up together, I really think is where I'm going next with um, thinking through intersectionality and how do we think more about intellectual freedom and social justice. So in general, I think it's really important to remember that intellectual freedom is actually a right. Um, it's a right that we think of 
that is actually part of the UN Declaration of Human Rights. And as part of this book, I'm actually looking through the arguments um, that were made for and against the various articles in um, the UN Declaration of Human Rights. They're actually available to everybody. <laughs> they were taken verbatim. So you can see how the different countries thought through what should we include in as articles in the UN Declaration of Human Rights. So really article 18 and 19 in many ways work together. So everyone has the right to freedom of thought and conscious religion. This includes freedom to change his religion or belief. And then article 19, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information as through any media or regardless of So what of course people did not keep in mind at that time is that we would be living in a place where information moves so quickly that there are not the same gatekeepers that existed in 1948. And also that we wouldn't understand what I'm going to call stickiness, and that will come back later, how some certain ideas stick um, and others don't. So I highly recommend reading words, uh, <clears throat> words that harm. Uh, this is from Matsuda. So it talks about critical race theory, how critical race theory uses the experience of subordination to offer a phenomenology of race and law. Um, the victim's experience reminds us that the harm of racist hate message, message is real harm to real people. <clears throat> so I actually recommend that um, this is really where we get into I, issues of how can we have both this idea of people having the right to freedom of opinion and expression while also recognizing that that can cause harm to people. So I think it's still a matter of thinking through these issues. So there are not easy answers to this. So I do have here Elizabeth Anderson talking about what citizens ultimately owe to each other is the social conditions of the freedoms people need to function as equal citizens. That social justice about, is about relationships among people and not the distribution of goods. And I would say that relationship includes communication among people, that there's a difference between equality, equity, and equality, and that access to information itself is related to individual and group demographics. And I think one thing that is often lost is that it is our right to intellectual freedom that allows marginalized voices to be heard. What do I mean by that? So what I mean is that if we consider the powers that be in general, even in our country, would you trust, for example, the Supreme Court as, as it is constituted right now to make decisions about what hate speech is in America. Would you trust them to do that? Also, in the wake of, for example, the George Floyd murder last year, many people started recommending various books. Where do those books come from? What sort of right do we have to those books? What if, for example, the government that was in power said no, we can't have people read those books. For example, something like Stamped from the Beginning. So I think it's always important to think through that we actually live in a world that is um, that has structural racism, that is white supremacist, that is heterosexist, um, <clears throat> that uh, is classist. And in fact, one way that we get ideas out to fight against that is by saying everybody has the right to say something. Now, what you might be thinking is, well, what about the people who protested and how were they reacted? What, what was the reaction? And it's not that there will be no reaction, right? 
it's much more that you still have the right to protest. Um, I actually had an interesting, uh, well, this will go a little bit to what I'm talking about next, but I was on the Fife call today. Fife is the Freedom of Expression Network for um, IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations. And there were many people in um, developing countries who were actually quite concerned about what happened to the former president's Twitter account because their fear is that, well, what happens in my country if say an authoritarian government says that, um, <clears throat> when an authoritarian government says that this person should have their Twitter account taken down, will Twitter be willing to do that? Now, there are lots of different ways to think about that. I'm gonna give you one way to think about it, but what was interesting to me was the concern, right? That is a concern that Twitter was able to take away the president of the United States Twitter account. What would they do to me as a little person, right? I'm not saying that that's what, how we should think about it. I'm just saying that I had not heard that concern before. I just heard it this morning, I am still thinking it through, right? Thinking about what should our response to that be? I mean, overall, I think the major problem is that we have given so much social space to these private companies in the first place, right? It is a problem that Jack Dorsey has so much say over our public sphere. Um, overall, that is just an issue and we have not dealt with that issue well. I always tell my students, it is a problem that we allowed Google Books to happen in the first place. We have given our cultural heritage to a private company. Um, why did we make that decision? And why do we keep making those decisions? I think those are all very, very difficult. So what I really am thinking for now is uh, Danielle Allen's flow model. Danielle, Danielle Allen is at Harvard. Um, I actually taught her to talk about this on the Ezra Klein show and I got very excited. She does a lot of work on thinking about policy but she's also a classicist. <laughs> so she is part of the group that came up with like, what will we be like after the pandemic? Um, and how should we think about how our society be could become more just. But I really like her flow model. So let me tell you a little bit about this works. This is really thinking about social media and how do we account for something like misinformation, disinformation, hate speech on social media. So her model has three things, volume, vis velocity, and viscosity which took me a little bit to, as you can see, to come up with uh, images for. So volume is pretty clear, right? Volume is how much, what is one person saying? So think about this in terms of one person's Twitter feed. How much are they do, doing? Then the next question is how fast, how fast are those words coming out? Volume is of course a measurable unit. You can think about word counts or time spent on discourse. <laughs> Finally, there's viscosity. And I think this is the most interesting part of thinking about her work, which is what is the stickiness of it? And you have to think of all three of these things together. So volume, velocity, and viscosity. And I actually think this is what Twitter did with Donald Trump's um, uh, Twitter feed, which is that it actually was thinking, what is the stickiness of this person's words? So this is the dynamic flow model. Um, I won't go through the whole thing, but this is a way of thinking about that, about how do we understand discourse? And I'll give you an easy way of thinking about it in a second. So Alan's model is grounded in two types of discourse, influential and expressive. She describes influential discourse as being related to structural decision-making, but expressive discourse is part of an expressive 
community formation. So I think that's an important point because often we aren't always thinking about who the audience is for a particular thing. One of the problems with social media and actually the internet in general is that things are flattened. Um, this is always an issue, especially when I'm dealing with undergraduates. One of the things that's so hard to get them to understand about something like peer reviewed literature, for example, is that it all looks the same, right? It looks the same if it's coming through, uh, you know, TikTok or whatever, as it does if it's coming through one of the databases. It all looks the same. And um, this is kind of a flattening that has happened in our online world. But there are, in fact, different audiences for different types of discourse. So what separates the two, Alan says, is there are different motivations for the actors. How many people are exposed to the ideas and the methods of getting buy-in? So this is about influential and expressive discourse. Influential discourse can be understood as a communication that brings about change. While expressive discourse has a different intent and moves through distinct community types, even though actual mediums of communication may be the same. <clears throat> so the way this works, if you think about an individual person's Twitter feed, um, and this is what Alan talked about quite a bit on um, the podcast that I was listening to that really got me thinking more about this. So what you actually do is increase uh, surveillance, depending on how many followers somebody has. So basically, if you have a blue check mark, the inference is that you have more velocity, more volume, and more viscosity. Your words actually should be subject to higher surveillance than people without a blue check mark. The blue check mark I'm just using as sort of like a heuristic. You could actually say like, it could be based on how many followers you have, for example. But um, it's a way of saying, well, because you have so many people listening to you, because you have such influential discourse, in fact, there will be more scrutiny on the words that you say overall. Um, and that's why this important, that's why this uh, concept of viscosity, of stickiness is so important. And this is often left off when we talk about things like social justice um, and free speech, because <clears throat> sometimes we say things like, well, it's in the discourse, right? But it actually matters who is saying something. And in fact, if you have a more influential space, then you should be subject to more, um, to more uh, surveillance than others are. So I can talk more about Alan's um, excellent model. Um, I really encourage people to um, take a look at, this is actually in a shorter book that she has. Um, I'm not able to walk over and get it right now, um, but I highly recommend just thinking a bit about how do we think about setting up policy. Um, so to me, the way we think can think about policy is either as big P or little p, right? Thinking about if you have something like Twitter, then you need to think more clearly about the audiences that you have. It's a little different if you are at a small community library, right? Then you need to think a little bit differently about the policies that you develop. <clears throat> So I'm hoping that I can do a bit more with this flow of modern discourse and connect it to issues of intersectionality because I think that has a lot to do with this idea of volume, velocity, and viscosity um, and thinking about how ideas are presented, who is presenting them, and how they are received by the audience. So I always put this in here um, in my work because I think it relieves a lot of pressure. So I often hear from people when they think about things like in the previous question about um, when a book is highly recommended and really good a topic, uh, but the author is transphobic. 
So I think the question is, <clears throat> when you think through something like that, what are you, what are you hoping to achieve by removing that book, for example, from the collection? Um, how are you hoping to protect the people who come in? How do you know how they would react to particular ideas? Also, I think that balancing this idea, the ideas of say, individual progress along with group identity, right? If we think about these things as putting them all together, you have to think much more <clears throat> about each individual person and how they might think about such ideas and also about what am I, who am I as a person making decisions about the information that people should or should not be exposed to. I think these are very different, difficult questions, which is really why I like Jenna Friedman's um, ideas about thinking about, for example, collections, that you should strive to achieve representation, not balance. So sometimes when I'm reading through things, I see people say, well, if I buy this one book, I need to get this other book to like, you know, cancel it out. But that's not really how collections work. It's really important to keep the mission of your institution in mind and different institutions have different missions. They have different community spaces in which they operate. And thinking about representation is very important because <clears throat> I think we often forget, and this is something that I do in a lot of my work, is that a lot of us are in communities that are similar to ourselves. So when I do my work on trigger warnings, it's always fascinating when I do work on trigger warnings because there will be one person who will come up to me and say something like, well, <clears throat> sometimes I'm not sure when to use a trigger warning or a content warning. And then I have someone else who comes up and says, I've never heard of a trigger warning before. before. Can you tell me what that is? And what I know from those questions is that those people operate in very different interpretive communities. And so it's important to keep the community itself in mind <clears throat> as you are working through issues of intellectual freedom and social justice. So I actually bring this up, especially because um, I've done work on diverse books and you'll see as you like, this is just a bunch of books that have been uh, challenged at various points. And you'll see that many of them are in fact about uh, topics relating to people who have marginalized identities. So <clears throat> it's important to remember that as we think about things like, how do we make sure that people are not using their influence within a community to keep certain ideas out, that it's in fact these books, <coughs> sorry, I should get some water, that are the targets of challengers and censors um, across and still are. So if you look at the top 10 books that were challenged last year, eight out of 10 of them were books by diverse authors. This is really the importance of keeping, this is where we see the intersection of intellectual freedom and social justice. And why I truly believe that intellectual freedom leads to social justice is by keeping this idea that <clears throat> we are against censorship that allows people to read books like this and books that were on the top 10 list last year. So I'm happy to answer any questions um, you might have. You have a sampling of my books here um, and I can go to the Google forums or have people chat questions, however you'd like to do that. Thank you, Dr. Knox. Thank you so much for that amazing presentation. And we do have, um, uh, we have at least 
let's see. I, I think it's just, we have one question so far. It says, could you talk about how to document bullying? How to document bullying? Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm okay. wondering if this, I, I think that is, a, that is a new question. So yes. Okay. Um, so if you think about harassment policies, I think the important thing to remember is that they're all subject to interpretation. So my recommendation would be to over document rather than under document, but also remember that the people reading that documentation will not necessarily interpret what you are saying the same way. So when I talk about hate speech with my students, for example, um, I give examples where people do not use necessarily hateful words in what they are talking about. It's the overall sentiment that is hateful that leads to understanding that this is in fact hate speech. But I would say to over-document it, and to say why this is a, um, a hateful idea. So that actually came up, I listened to a lot of podcasts. So they were talking about, um, of course, the murders in Atlanta and the former president's use of the term China flu. And it's not necessarily that China flu, right, is hate speech. It's the way in which he was using the term China flu that is hate speech. And so it's often difficult to trans to communicate that overall um, sentiment and foundation to people because it takes more work, right? Than to say like someone called me this name, right? You have to look at the overall situation that we were in even the person that was saying this, the context in which they, which they were saying this, right? This actually goes to Daniel Allen's flow model quite well because it was the volume and it was the velocity and it was the stickiness of it, right? That makes it hate speech. So thinking about documentation that way, if you include on your form something about the context, I think is really important. Okay, thank you for, for your response. And we now have a, another question. It says, um, you, you speak of keeping the community in mind and keeping our mission in mind when considering what, what stays in or is added in our collections and what may be removed. Sometimes um, the prevailing ideas in a given community are problematic ones though. How do we balance serving our community while fighting for more space for marginalized voices and diverse perspectives perspectives in such communities. Um, I don't wanna be perceived as like trying to socially engineer my community, but I also think my role gives me a, a responsibility as it does all librarians to advance justice. Where's the balance? Right, so this goes back to uh, what uh, Jenna Friedman says about balance as opposed to representation. So really your goal is not to achieve balance. Your goal is to achieve representation. And yes, it is true that many librarians and other information professionals work in conservative uh, <clears throat> communities, communities that have may have ideas with which you as an information professional, you as a person disagree with. It doesn't necessarily mean that you should never I mean, people go to the library for many different reasons, right? Um, I don't think that librarians should be in the business of saying necessarily what people should read and that they should not read bad books because that is what librarians did for many, many years. And bad books eventually become classics. They become books that help us understand history. Um, I think that the way to think about this is that you need to look at your collection as a whole and say, what is not represented? It doesn't have to be balanced, but what is not represented? 
and make sure you add those voices in. <clears throat> it's possible that those books will not um, circulate as much, right? But that means you have to have a good reading policy, which I always emphasize to my students, that is not just based on circulation counts, right? It's also based on whether or not these ideas, these topics, the overall representation in your collection. Um, too many um, counting becomes very important, I know, in libraries. I know it does. But it's not enough to just say, this is, this is circulated so many times and, or has not circulated. Sometimes you actually don't know that it hasn't circulated because, in fact, there is a kid who is looking at a book on LGBTQ issues, but they have not checked it out. Often they haven't checked it out because you don't have a self-checkout. They are in fact taking it into a corner and reading it, but you would never know that, right? Because they put it back. Um, thinking a little bit more about how people actually use books. So this talks about, um, are about like, when I talk about things like reading practices and print culture, I'm really interested in how people think about books themselves and actually looking around and saying, okay, this didn't have a circulation count, but it's possible that someone actually just looked at this book and read it themselves because they might get in trouble if they take it home, right? Okay, um, we have a couple more questions that have come in. Um, so the, the next one is thinking about something like JK Rowling's transphobic comments. If we want to keep works that are culturally significant like Harry Potter, how can we condemn the prejudice um, for hate speech of authors or at least make sure we don't tact tactically um, uh, endorse them? So I, I will tell you personally, I think there is way too much emphasis on the author themselves, right? And who they are as a person. Um, it, it, this is part of how, in fact, you know, theory and criticism works now. I don't necessarily think that that's necessarily the best way to go about thinking about it because every, I'm not excusing JK Rowling's behavior. I think it is abominable, but the idea that you catch somebody in something, um, and I'm not saying she was caught, but I'm saying that the idea that <clears throat> people's work is solely negated by whoever they are, I think is actually a problem. So I've been thinking about this a lot with cancel culture. Um, I'm a big fan of ContraPoints um, and her work on cancel culture. She has actually been canceled herself. Um, she is controversial herself, but I don't think that as a librarian, so in your professional capacity, that it is your job to be as concerned about people's abominable behavior as it is in your personal life. Some of you might agree with that, some of you might not. But I worry that that leads to slippery slopes that we don't necessarily want to go into as professionals. So for example, I do not watch Woody Allen's movies, right? I just don't watch them. Um, I have no personal reason to watch them, I'm not interested in them, and I particularly do not want to support him. But I don't think that libraries should not have his movies in their collection. Now, that's difficult, right? <clears throat> but I don't think it's the mission of the library, a public library, right? And especially an academic library, to say, we aren't going to collect Woody Allen's movies. Woody Allen's movies are very influential over our current culture. The same is true for Harry Potter. I'm not saying that these are easy choices to make. They are not easy. They may go against your own personal values. 
One thing I emphasize in my intellectual freedom and censorship class is that in fact, your professional values may not be the same as your own personal values. But when you are working as a librarian or information professional, you must think about what am I doing here as a professional? And it's not easy because you may end up <clears throat> talking to someone about things that, not that are unethical, but you may end up recommending a book that you don't necessarily agree with, right? For various reasons. Um, I just, I just worry if professional librarians get into the business of removing books, not necessarily based on merit, but on what somebody has done. I also think about this, and this is something I've been thinking about a lot, which is in one of ta Coates's things, he talked a lot about <clears throat> what is the most horrible thing that somebody could do, right? Um, and I, I really wish I could find this essay because it has stuck in my head for a long time um, about how we have made, in, in some ways like, and I have an article about this, about how being called a censor is like one of the worst things, is a terrible thing to be called. In the same way, like being called racist is a terrible thing to be called. And what ta Code says is like, isn't it, aren't there worse things? Are, what does it mean if someone, for example, is a murderer, right? Um, how do we think about, and this goes to this issue of, um, you know, thinking about people. It's, I'm not, I guess I don't have a lot of really good answers. It's just more that you have to think through what is my purpose? in this. Um, and I hope I can find that ta Coates essay. It was very good um, to think through, like, how do we basically think about what does it mean to be a person? What does it mean to be a terrible person? And how do we evaluate people that way? Um, thank you. And we, we have, I think, time for maybe just one more question. Um, and so I'm pull, still pulling from my list. Um, are there ways in which the wall from intellectual freedom to social justice occurs because of exclusively Western perspectives? Do we do bullying and cyberbullying through our own blindness of indigenous and non-Western ways of knowing and being? Okay, can you ask that? Can you say that one more time? Yes, ma'am. Are there ways in which the wall from intellectual freedom to social justice occurs because of exclusively Western perspectives? Do we bully and cyber, do we do bullying and cyber bullying through our own blindness of indigenous and non-Western ways of knowing and being? Absolutely. Um, we are all part of a, of our society, right? Um, just because I am a black woman does not mean that I do not harbor myself racist ideas about black people. Um, <clears throat> we live in a, the structures, when we talk about structural racism, for example, that means all of us, it is the structure. Um, and we absolutely do not identify um, how we are bullying marginalizing people who are indigenous or in non-Western groups. That's actually why I was so interested in hearing the people on Fife. There were people from all over the world on that call. And they were, they were thinking through what happened differently than I was, right? I have no problem with Twitter taking Donald Trump off. Like that's not an issue for me, but it was an issue for them. And I needed to think about it. Right, I, I needed to think through, well, first of all, what if I was in a very different country, right? 
living under different circumstances, and these were people in developing countries. It's really difficult. <clears throat> it, it's often difficult to step outside yourself that way. Um, actually, I was I was thinking about, especially in, in indigeneity recently, um, because of uh, Deb Holland becoming our new Secretary of the Interior. I think that's incredibly important. We've never had someone who is indigenous as our secretary in the interior. I'm excited to see what will happen. <clears throat> and then on Kickstarter, it seems like a really strange move, but on Kickstarter, there are many, uh, there's a new RPG that imagines a, an uncolonized turtle island, right? And I decided to buy it because it was written by indigenous people. Um, and I want to think more about this world. What if colonization hadn't happened, right? Um, it's not a world that's presented to us a lot in popular media, certainly not in tabletop RPGs. Um, so I bought the book. Um, and that's the sort of thing like, if you have games at your public library and you buy things like Pathfinder or the books for D&D, &D, this would be a book to consider buying because it offers an alternative way of thinking about the world that we live in. <clears throat> and that just goes to the power of books, I have to say, um, that, that why that's so important. Um, there was a question I just wanted to look at really quickly um in the chat box mm -hmm. was it the one about dr seuss yes uh you see it is it is there there a difference in terms of making those decisions based on the personal beliefs conduct of um slash conduct of authors and making them based on the content of the works themselves um like in like the infamous recent dr seuss examples I think this is difficult because the truth is like people are sexist and racist and um if you were trying to get rid of everything you would have nothing left right um someone was saying yesterday i just happened to look at ala think tank that they will never read agatha christie again because agatha christie was racist and i was like well have you read Agatha Christie's books? They are really racist and anti-Semitic. But actually, I like to read the books because I think they show more clearly how racism and anti-Semitism worked in the early 20th century. That is, they are not the focus of the book, but they show you how insidious and foundational those ideas were to that society because Agatha Christie lived that, she made it part of her books and actually it clarifies it for me. Um, and I would never suggest that people remove those books from their collection, right? Some of them are really well-written. Um, I really enjoy reading Poirot, you know, and Miss Marple and watching the shows. Um, I would be sad if those were taken away because I actually think that's important um, to see those ideas presented that way. I'm a big Sherlock Holmes fan as well. One of those short stories is incredibly racist. I had forgotten I was reading, it was listening to it. I was listening to Benedict Cumberbatch read it. Um, and I was like, oh, I forgot this one, right? But it shows how, what the actual world was like um, <clears throat> I think it's different, of course, when you're talking about royalties and people who are alive, that can make things more difficult. But I think, again, you need to think about your professional commitments and your professional personal commitments. Those don't always match, always, though we always do our best. And I, that's why I will say again, think about representation, not balance. So Dr. Knox, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your uh, your presentation and your comments and